Okay, good morning everyone there. Good morning, so uh, very good. Uh, let's continue on these uh, marvelous suttas and see what happens next. of thoughts, which is just a way of uh, uh, dividing the world into problems and non-problems. And then we have been looking at also in that sutta how to overcome those problems by using wisdom, by being wise about it. Uh, um, uh, but sometimes, you know, you use that wisdom technique which is mentioned there about seeing the dangers in these things uh, and the problems. Uh, but sometimes you need a bit of extra oomph to kind of get you away from these uh, uh, defilements of the mind. And uh, uh, one of the ways that we're going to look at now is some more techniques on how to get rid of these things. Uh, and as I mentioned yesterday, by far the most important one is getting rid of ill will, uh, yeah, upset, anger, uh, these kind of things. Uh, and uh, this next sutta is really just a way of getting rid of that. So for those of you who haven't been on these retreats before, uh, this is like one of the core suttas uh, in the Buddhist canon on how to overcome ill will. Uh. So uh, for that reason, I think it's very useful. Uh. And when we talk about wisdom, it is really what we mean is this particular way of seeing the world, uh, looking at the world in this way, and then applying your mind accordingly. That's really what is meant by wisdom. It's like you align your mind with the way the Buddha sees the world, the way the world actually is. Uh. And if you align your mind with that, uh, then that is what, by definition, is wisdom in the suttas. So, so uh, for this reason, this is, uh, I, I think, a very, a very useful, very practical discourse. It's certainly not just theoretical. So uh, uh, if you, uh, uh, so see how, s let's have a look at this first of all, and then we can maybe discuss it later if necessary. This is called removing resentment. And this discourse is given by Venerable Sariputta. And he was uh, known as the right-hand man of the Buddha. So if you sometimes you see a Buddhist shrine or a Buddhist uh, like we have here, and you will see Venerable Sariputta on the right-hand side of the Buddha. And uh, you know how to recognize Venerable Sariputta? Huh? You don't know? Okay. They have usually Venerable Sariputta is on one side, Mahamoglana on the other side, huh? and often they will have a different hand posture. So Mahamoglana will often be like this. Huh? Most of the disciples of the Buddha will have their hands in Anjali. Huh? But uh, Venerable Sariputta, he often has his hands like, like this. He sits like to one side like that. Uh. <laughs> That's how you recognize him. Uh. I'm not sure what the point, what the kind of the idea is, but uh, uh, that's, that's how you, I guess these are just ways of doing it, so I do re recognize people. I think that's kind of the point of it. Uh. So he was uh, considered the most wisest monk in the Sangha after the Buddha, uh, and uh, so his suttas, there's quite a lot of discourses uh, by Venerable Sariputta. Uh, <coughs> so, the goes as follows, there the Venerable Sariputta addressed the bhikkhus. Uh, friends, bhikkhus, friend, those bhikkhus replied, and the Venerable Sariputta said this. Friends, there are these five ways of removing resentment by which a bhikkhu should entirely remove resentment when it has arisen towards anyone. What five? Here a person's bodily behavior is impure, but his verbal behavior is pure. One should remove resentment towards such a person. Uh, a person's verbal behavior is impure, uh, but his bodily behavior is pure. Uh, one should remove resentment towards such a person. Uh, a person's bodily behavior and verbal behavior are impure, uh, but from time to time he gains an opening of the mind, placidity of mind. One should also remove resentment towards such a person. Uh, a person's bodily behavior and verbal behavior are impure, uh, and he does not gain an opening of the mind, placidity of the mind, from time to time. Uh, one should also remove resentment towards such a person. Uh, a person's bodily behavior and verbal behavior are pure, uh, and from time to time he gains an opening of the mind, placidity of the mind, uh, 
one should also remove resentment towards such a person. Uh. So that is the summary uh, of the sutta. And uh, uh, the purpose of all of these five people is, uh, first of all, it is to include everybody. Uh. So here you have from the most kind of dodgy person, uh, where everything is kind of wrong, to the, more to the completely saintly person, which everything is right. Uh. And then you have people in between that are partly good, uh, partly bad, uh, so that and maybe neutral even. So, uh, and uh, the point here is that um, when you deal with people with different qualities and how to overcome resentment or ill will or anger towards them varies depending on the qualities in the people. Uh, yeah, so this is kind of the point of this. Uh, there's a whole vari variety of people. Uh, the bad news is that there is no one you should not have ill will towards. Uh, that's the bad news. Uh, so even, even if there's someone you really, oh, so difficult, yeah, so hard, don't know what to do with this person, still, you should ideally not have any ill will towards people like that. Uh, at least not, at least you should try to kind of get out of it. Uh. So uh, that is both the bad news, but it's also the good news, yeah, because it shows you it is possible to get rid of any kind of ill will, regardless of who the people are here. Yeah. So let's have a look at this um, there's five, and the first, the first one first. Uh, and how, friends, uh, should resentment be removed towards the person whose bodily behavior is impure, but whose verbal behavior is pure? Suppose a rag draw bhikkhu sees a rag by the roadside. Uh, he would press it down with his left foot, spread it out with his right foot, tear off an intact section, uh, and take it away with him. Uh, so too, when a person's bodily behavior is impure, but his verbal behavior is pure, on that occasion one should not attend to the impurity of his bodily behavior, but should an instead attend to the purity of his verbal behavior. In this way, resentment towards that person should be removed. So it's a very simple principle, yeah, and it's kind of very obvious when you think about it. And that is that people are complex beings uh, with all kinds of qualities, some bad, some good, some neutral. Uh, and uh, as people, it's very easy often to talk about or think about other people's bad qualities. It's easy to focus on that. Uh, it's easy to have a kind of fault-finding mind and see the negative things. Uh, uh, but what this one here is saying is that instead of doing that, we should actually focus on the good qualities in other people instead uh, and sort of rejoice in the good qualities. Uh, and uh, so to be able to do that, uh, it is not, you know, because our habits often go in the opposite direction, you actually need to train your mind to, to do be able to do this kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, so you uh, pick out, you know, sometimes you know the people that you're having problems with, uh, and uh, you look at those people, uh, and this could be a family member, it could be a member of the BGF here, it could be someone in your workplace, yeah, especially people who are reasonably close to us, people we have to deal with on a daily or weekly basis or something like that. Uh, and you look at them uh, and then you uh, see the whole person, you see the good qualities and the bad qualities. And you very often, if you look carefully, sometimes you have to look really carefully, uh, you will see uh, that actually this person has a lot of good qualities. Uh. So, um, and it is surprising once you start reflecting on the good qualities in other people, actually there's a often a lot there. Yeah, there's a lot of things going on. It's just that we haven't really focused on, on before. Uh, and it's wonderful when you do that. Uh, and one of the things that is, uh, you know, wonderful about a place like a Buddhist place, like the BGF or any Buddhist community anywhere really, uh, is that people who come to a place like this, uh, even though they are not perfect, even though they may have flaws in their character or whatever, at the very least they have an intention. They want to do the right thing, they want to live well, they want to support others, they want to support themselves. And just having that intention, uh, that kind of lofty state of the mind, that actually you want to do what is right, wow, that is already really worth celebrating. Uh. Most people in the world don't even think like this, they kind of just carry on uh, and they don't really have any very clear idea that they want to do what is right and to live well. Uh. So already that is often enough to celebrate, because uh, that means the big picture is good. Uh, so even though they fail sometimes, uh, even if they fail often, yeah, uh, the very fact that they are trying is really worth celebrating. Uh. This is one way of doing this. Uh. 
Just the other day, I, uh, I, I, I wrote a birthday card for my father. My father was 80 years old, so getting, getting very old. So I wrote that birthday card, and I thought, you know, it's, it's time to say something nice, I thought, for my parents. He's 80 years old. Uh, I, I've tried to say nice things before, but let me write him a nice, really nice birthday letter. Yeah, I can't really give anything. I don't have anything to give, so let me write him a nice birthday letter instead. And that's like a gift. Uh, so I sat down trying to think about all the qualities, yeah, and kind of reminding him of all the good things in his life. Uh, and suddenly the letter was so long, uh, yeah. Uh, I didn't know where to stop anymore. I couldn't. I said, oh, I've got to stop now. I've got to have other things to do as well. I'm going to Malaysia soon or whatever. I've got to, you know. <laughs> but it, was, it, it turned out to be really long, yeah. So once you start thinking about these things, remind, remind yourself, actually, there's a lot there to be said. Uh, and especially when you know someone very close, like a, like a family member. Uh, and it's really nice to do that because, uh, you know, sometimes when we appreciate the good qualities in each other like that, uh, those qualities tend to grow. Huh? Yeah, if we, f if we see the faults in someone else, then sometimes they live up to those bad qualities. Uh, but if we see the good qualities in someone, it's almost as if other people want to live up to that trust that you have in them. Uh, oh, I see so many good qualities in you. You are a very kind-hearted person, very generous. And you think, really? Okay, I better live up to that. <laughs> live up to that. So you become more kind-hearted. Uh, you become better because other people see good qualities in you. Uh, so it's almost like a gift to others as well when you, s when you try to focus on the good qualities in them. Uh, it's a wonderful thing to be able to do. Uh. So you have here this um, a beautiful little simile yeah, who explains how you do this. It's like a rag-robed bhikkhu. Uh, a rag-robed bhikkhu is like a bhikkhu who puts together his robe from rags. Uh. I used to have one of these rag robes. Uh, and it looked, looked kind of a bit funny, I must admit, but it was a, it was a rag robe. And in those days, it was quite common. Cloth was very expensive in ancient India. So you would kind of put together the rags, and you would find a rag in the gutter. You find a rag outside the shops where they sold cloth. Uh, you find a rags. One of the most famous places for finding rags was on the charnel ground. A charnel ground is a place where they would burn the corpses. Or the corpses would just be left to rot, yeah, eaten by maggots or whatever else. Uh, and so as a bhikkhu, you would go to the charnel ground uh, and when the corpse was still reasonably fresh, uh, you would take the cloth off uh, because they would be wrapped in cloth uh, and you would use that on your robe. Uh. What do you think of that? Is that a good idea? <laughs> you have to be pretty quick, yeah? If you wait too long, that, r that cloth is going to be really disgusting, yeah? So you have to be fairly quick. Yeah? And there's one story, I, I always tell this story because it's kind of a quite amusing story here. Yeah? And this was one bhikkhu, he did, he did go to the charnel ground, but the corpse was a little bit too fresh. Yeah, because what happens when the corpse is really, really fresh? What happens? The corpse is maybe not, not quite cold yet, they're still kind of warm. What happens then is that when you take the cloth off the corpse that is too fresh, the corpse starts to protest. Don't take my cloth. There's still a bit of consciousness there. Yes, according to this story, the corpse was saying, don't take my cloth. And the monk, yeah, you're dead, shut up, you know. <laughs> and so he, he, he takes the cloth, yeah, all the way, and this corpse is not amused. So the corpse gets up, uh, yeah, and the bhikkhu looks behind, the corpse is coming behind him. So the bhikkhu starts running, he runes back to his cutie, slams the door, and the corpse comes after him, and just as it arrives at the door, it collapses. Uh. This is the first zombie movie. Yeah? This, uh, zombies were our originally Buddhist invention. It goes back to the Buddhist Vinaya, yeah, according to this. So this is the zombie, the, the corpse coming behind you. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Yeah? You, you wonder where these ideas come from. Well, the two and a half thousand years, the idea of the, of the zombies, at least. Uh, so this shows you the dangers of being a, a rag robe monk. So these days, I don't take any chances. I don't, I don't wear rag robed. Uh, I grow up, I you know, don't take any risks with corpses following me behind, all this kind of stuff. Uh, so that's why <laughs> I wear it. So this is also allowed for monks to wear uh, robes that are actually, this one here is probably made by a, a shop somewhere or made by a monastery in Thailand or something. I'm not sure where it comes from. Uh, but um, so this is very kind of nice. So anyway, so these were the rag robe monks. Uh, and um, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? This story is found in the Vinaya Pitaka. Uh, you think the Vinaya Pitaka is really boring, it's full of rules and all kind of stuff. Uh, but actually there's some really kind of amusing, amazing stories <laughs> in the Vinaya Pitaka. So, um, uh, what do you do? Well, if you are a rag robiku, you see a rag by the robe side, you are very pleased, uh, yeah, because you need rags. Uh, so you press it down where your left foot, spread it out where your right foot, yeah, and this is like, you can imagine, this is like, 
getting an overview of the cloth. You can see the good parts, the bad parts. Uh, in the same way, we get an overview of the person in our mind. We see the good side, we see the bad side, we see kind of whatever is there. Uh, yeah? And then once you uh, see the whole cloth, you tear off uh, the side that are rotten, that are rubbish, that are uh, too polluted or whatever. You tear those off and you throw it away. You get rid of it. Why? Because it's rubbish. In the same way, when you have the person in front of you, you see all the qualities, uh, then the bad qualities, uh, they're rubbish. Uh, you like tear it off, yeah? you tear off the bad qualities, throw them out of your mind, uh, and all you do is keep the good qualities. Uh. So you tear off the intact section, uh, take it with you. In the same way, the good qualities of that person, uh, you take them with you, take them into your heart, uh, and then you carry them with you into the future. Uh, it's like you have a little shelf in your mind, uh, and on that shelf you have person A, B, C, D, yeah? and person, some, these, are, these are some of the person you find perhaps a bit difficult sometimes, uh, and then you have all the good qualities of these people on this shelf. Yeah, all this... Um, uh, beautiful qualities. So whenever you need them because some negative thought arises or whatever, you go to that shelf, uh, you pull down the negative, the good qualities, uh, and then it neutralizes that negative state of mind that you have. You remember, actually, the good qualities are far more important uh, and far more of them uh, than the negative qualities. Uh, and then in this way, you neutralize your uh, fault-finding mind and seeing the negative things. Uh, but you have to be fairly quick. You can't allow the negative thought to be settled too much. If it settles too much, it becomes too strong. It becomes hard to dislodge it. Uh, so this is, um, this is really all there is to it. And sometimes it's also useful to uh, forgive a little bit the negative qualities, uh, yeah? And to not to be too surprised that people have some negative qualities. Uh, of course they do. We all live in this world together. This world is not always so easy to live in. Uh, we have been conditioned by all of these various things. Uh, of course people have negative qualities. What do you expect? Yeah, we can sometimes don't get treated all that well by other people. Uh, it's a miracle people don't have more good qualities. Uh, that's a really positive perception. Yeah, wow, I'm so happy you don't have more, good, more bad qualities. Uh, don't say that to anyone. They might <laughs> think you are a bit funny. But it can think like that. Yeah, what a wonderful thing it is that people actually are still are reasonably restrained and have so many good qualities. And then you can forgive the bad ones uh, and you can actually focus on the good qualities instead. Uh. So this is what you have to do. But it takes training. It takes kind of, uh, you know, you have to think about these things quite a lot and then it kind of comes together. Yeah. Now one of the things that I would like to point out, and this is kind of a question that I sometimes get from people, uh, and they say, well, is this really realistic? Uh, how realistic is it to just focus on the good qualities? We know that people don't have just good qualities. Uh, isn't the purpose of the Buddhist path to see according to reality? Yatha Buddha Nanadasana, aren't we deluding ourselves by just focusing on the good qualities? Uh, and it's a good question because, yes, of course, the, it is the purpose of Buddhism is to see things according to reality. Uh. But the problem is, what is that reality? Uh. If you take a person, and uh, you maybe someone you find, very, you find a bit difficult, uh, you find another person who is their best friend. They love this person. I think it's so great. Uh. So what is the reality? What is this person actually like? Are they the way you look at them? Are they the way that someone else looks at them? Uh. What, what actually are they? And this is the problem. It is impossible to pin down a person and say they are like this. And it's impossible to pin them down in the present moment, let alone over a period of time, because we are changing all the time. Yeah? One day you are grumpy in the morning, or oh, really bad. The next day, wow, you're so happy. Yeah, the whole world is wonderful. Which one of those people are you? You're, you are both, and you are neither. You cannot really say that you are any of that. You are just this stream of changing phenomena, always changing. Yeah? So if you can't pin people down, how can you say you are good, you are bad, you are like this? Uh, you cannot really say that. Uh, you can never compare people. Uh, yeah? Comparison is impossible precisely because we are always changing. Uh, and this is very even more true over different lifetimes, but it's also true in this lifetime here itself. Uh, and over time, uh, you know, especially if you practice this path, uh, you gradually become better. Uh, and by coming 
by becoming better also, uh, you are also changing again. Uh. So remember, one of the problems with uh, judging people uh, is that when you judge somebody uh, and you say, you are like this, you have these qualities, uh, you're also, in a sense, trapping them a little bit in that personality. Uh. You're trapping them in those qualities uh, because they will feel, you always feel if someone is judging you, uh, and you will feel that there is no way out of that judgment. Uh. But if we don't judge people, uh, if we allow people to change, uh, it's actually an act of kindness, uh, it's an act of metta, because we, uh, it means that uh, they also feel free then to change, they don't feel so much trapped in those negative qualities, or whatever it is. Uh. So it's kind not to judge people too hard. Uh, but uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that you cannot really pin people down, we are always changing. Uh. So because of that, uh, to, uh, you know, to um, uh, judge people or to say you are like this or anything like that or, or whatever else uh, you have both good or bad qualities all of that doesn't really work uh. so instead of asking ourselves what is the reality because there is no reality instead we I need to ask ourselves what is useful uh. yeah well if there is no reality we have to have some other way of deciding how we should look at people and the right way of looking is what is useful? Uh, what is useful for my own spiritual development? Uh, and what is also useful for helping the other person? And what is useful is metta. Yeah, what is useful is kindness. Uh, what is useful is seeing the good qualities. Uh, and so we use that as our standard for how to look at others. Uh. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. It's in a sense, it's very obvious, uh, but it's also very interesting. What is useful is, mo is here what really matters, because there is no reality uh, as far as people, what they are like, what their qualities are. Yeah. When we talk about seeing things according to reality in Buddhism, it doesn't mean these kind of things. Uh, what it means is more like profound things that are uh, characteristics of all existence. And that's why we talk about seeing things according to reality is the three characteristics, uh, anicca, dukkha, anatta, because these are core aspects that are part of all of existence. Uh, and uh, that is where we can see things according to reality. Uh. So, uh, uh, there you are. That is uh, what you do, and this, what you're seeing here, is a way of overcoming resentment. It's a way of overcoming ill will, but it's also a way of developing metta. The two are, go together. You cannot really separate the two. You overcome ill will is the same as developing metta to a large extent. Uh, the two have to go together. Yeah. Okay, next one. Yeah. How, friends, should resentment be removed? towards the person whose verbal behavior is impure, but whose bodily behavior is pure. Suppose there is a pond covered with algae and water plants. A man might arrive afflicted and oppressed by the heat, weary, thirsty and parched. He would plunge into the pond, sweep away the algae and water plants with his hands, and drink, drink from his cupped hands, and then leave. So too, when a person's verbal behavior is impure, but his bodily behavior is, is pure. On that occasion, one should not attend to the impurity of his verbal behavior, but should instead attend to the purity of his bodily behavior. In this way, resentment towards that person should be removed. So here, uh, there is a, the difference here is basically the simile. Uh, and the difference is also uh, the type of qualities that the person has. Uh, here it is a different set of qualities that we need to focus on. Uh, yeah, and it is just again recognizing that people are different. Uh, we need to look at different things depending on, uh, on different who the person is. Uh. Um, what, I is there any particular importance to this distinction between bodily behavior and verbal behavior? Does that really matter? Uh, and uh, I don't know uh, if there is. Uh, I think the main point is simply to point out that people have different good qualities and different bad qualities. Uh, and sometimes the same person will have that as well. It will change. The other person will actually, uh, will actually uh, change. And one day his good qualities are one thing, another day they might be something else. Uh, so this is also part of this. Uh, so whatever there are good qualities, uh, that is what you focus on. This is kind of the purpose of this. Uh, but then you have this simile here, this beautiful simile about this pond that is covered with algae and water plants. So the pond, this is the person, and the algae and the water plants, they are like the bad qualities that you see. Yeah? So you see these bad qualities. And then a man arrives, or a person arrives, 
afflicted and oppressed by the heat, uh, weary and thirsty. Uh, and being oppressed by the heat means that you have some ill will or anger uh, towards that pond, uh, yeah, that person. Uh, and you are weary and thirsty. Uh, you are kind of trying to find something to get you away from that, uh, um, t that heat, yeah, to cool you down again. So in a sense you can say you're already looking for those good qualities, yeah, to cool you down, to get rid of the heat. Uh, and so what you do then is that you uh, plunge into that pond, you sweep away the algae and the water plants, uh, you sweep away those bad qualities in that person, you don't want to see them, they are bad, they are rubbish. Uh, and then what you have left is just a beautiful water underneath, uh, so you drink that water with your cupped hands. Uh, you take on board the good qualities, take them inside of you, bring them into your mind and heart, uh, and then when you get out of the pond afterwards, you carry them with you. Uh, and the rubbish, you leave it behind, uh, but you take the good things with you. Uh. So again, a very similar idea as the previous one, uh, but just a slightly different way of looking at the, slightly different simile here, uh, but uh, the idea of bringing with you the good qualities of the person. Uh. Let's go on to the next one. Uh. And how, friends, uh, should resentment be removed towards the person whose bodily and verbal behavior are impure, but who from time to time gains an opening of the mind, placidity of mind? Suppose there is a little water in a puddle, then a person might arrive afflicted and oppressed by the heat, weary, thirsty and parched. He would think this little bit of water is in the puddle. If I try to drink it with my cupped hands or a vessel, I will stir it up, disturb it and make it undrinkable. Uh, let me get down on all fours and suck it up like a cow and then depart. Uh, he then gets down on all fours, uh, sucks the water up like a cow and departs. So too when a person's bodily behavior and verbal behavior are impure, but from time to time he gains an opening of the mind, placidity of mind, uh, on that occasion, one should not attend to the impurity of the bodily behavior and the verbal behavior, but should instead attend to the opening of the mind, the placidity of mind he gains from time to time. In this way, resentment towards that person should be removed. So here we have a person who only has a tiny bit of good qualities. Uh, yeah, They say bad things, they do bad things by action but they have a few mental good qualities. This is what it means by um, having an opening of the mind, placidity of the mind. The opening of the mind, the Pali word for that is vivarana, vivarana chitta, and vivarana is the opposite of nivarana. Do you know the Pali word nivarana? Uh, any Pali experts here? I know one Pali expert, uh, but uh, so uh, pa ni nivarana is the five hindrances, yeah? Pancha and nivarana, five hindrances. Uh, these are the things we have to abandon. This is what we're trying to do here. And vivarana is the opposite of that. Uh, it means like an opening of the mind. Instead of a closing or an obstacle, this is like the opening up the path, yeah? Vivarana chitta. Uh. So this is what is meant here. So really it means a person who has a pure mind, uh, who is able to maybe attain a bit of nice meditation, sitting down, experiencing a bit of joy and happiness. That's what happens when you have the vivarana chitta. And then you also have not just the vivarana chitta, but you also have the um, placidity of mind. Uh, this is the uh, pas pasada chitta, or pasada. This is from pasidati, means the mind that has confidence, is placid, is pure, is inspired, yeah, that kind of mind. Uh, this word pasada is a little bit hard to translate into English, but it has all of these qualities kind of coming together. Yeah. So, uh, so what the Buddha is saying here is that we should, well not the Buddha, Venerable Sariputta, uh, what he is saying here is that we should be very careful, we should look for good qualities wherever they are. Yeah, we should really uh, find even the tiniest kind of good qualities, in this case in the mind. How do you even know that someone has good qualities in their mind? Well, usually we know, we can infer that. Uh, yeah, we can read someone else's mind. Uh, is that right? Uh, can you read people's minds? Uh? You can, yeah. Each one of us, we actually read people's minds all the time. Why is that? This is one of those interesting things. Usually when we think about mind reading, you think, well, okay, I'm going into your, your mind and reading your thoughts, yeah? 
And that is usually, I, it's very rare to find anyone who can do that. I don't think I've ever really heard, seen anyone reliably reading minds. But actually, we all read minds in another way. We just watch someone's conduct and you know straight away whether someone is angry or not. Yeah, You can tell by the conduct. Or you can tell if they are confused or whether they are restless and all these kind of things. You just look at them. It's not, you know, you can't see the subtle things maybe, but the coarse things we can all see. We are all mind readers. So now you know, mind reading, you're already there, yeah? You thought of these monks or whatever who are mind readers, well, you're already doing it, there's no difference. Uh, of course, if you become more peaceful and more, uh, have more stillness in yourself, uh, it is more easy to pick up on other people as well, so you become more uh, sensitive to these things. Uh, there was a famous monk in Thailand called Ajahn Ben, and he always he said that uh, the, this mind reading stuff is really overrated. Uh, all you have to do is look at how someone sweeps the path uh, and straight away you know where their mind is at. Uh. So he was very kind of keen faculties. Uh, you just look at somebody, how peaceful are their actions, uh, how, you know, what are they like, and then straight away you know where, the, where their mind state is at, uh, how good their meditation is. So we already mind read it. So this is what this is saying. Yeah, we kind of we kind of have some idea of other people. Their bodily behavior may be bad, or the verbal behavior not so good. But still, we have a feeling for where they are at mentally, and and we know these things with other people. So the point here, how important it is to be able to focus on even on the smallest good qualities in other people. Yeah, seeing that and rejoicing in the other good qualities. Sometimes there may be a lot of bad things to be seen, but actually be really happy over the small good qualities. Why is it that the Buddha put so much emphasis on seeing the good qualities? In other words, why does he focus so much on metta? Because this is what metta is about. Not seeing the bad stuff, seeing the good things and rejoicing in that. Why is that? <coughs> Oops. <coughs> the uh, alternative to metta is karuna, and that is compassion, that is coming in the next one. Uh, and that is when you cannot see any uh, good qualities in somebody, all you can see is bad ones. Uh, then you can't do metta, because there's nothing good to focus on. Then you have to have compassion instead. Uh, and we'll show you in a minute how that works. Uh, so what the Buddha is saying here is that we should try to have metta before we do compassion as much as possible. Uh, this is really what he's saying. That's why we have the sequence. Yeah, remember in Buddhism, everything in the suttas is sequential. All sequences have a purpose. Uh, there's nothing, no such thing as a random number of things in the suttas. Uh, they always have a purpose. And here, so here the purpose is we should try to have metta again and again and again before we go to compassion. Uh, and when you look at the Brahma Viharas, yeah, the four divine abidings in the suttas, uh, four Brahma Viharas, metta, karuna, mudita, and upeka, yeah. Is everyone familiar with the four Brahma Viharas? Yeah? Um, and uh, always the same sequence. Yeah? Always metta first. Uh, and uh, if you look at the suttas, the kind of the thing that the Buddha talks about most about is the metta. Metta is what is mentioned most of the time. Why is metta first? Why is metta uh, talked about here as well first? And the answer pr is, I think, that uh, uh, with metta there is no danger here. Uh, when you have see metta with someone else, it is positive for everyone. It's positive for you, it's positive for the other person. You can't really go, go wrong with seeing the positive qualities in other people. Uh, uh, or usually it's difficult to go wrong. Uh, whereas with compassion, it's more easy to go wrong. When you have compassion, it is also a focus on the Excuse me, on the suffering of others, uh, yeah, because you have compassion, you want to alleviate the suffering of other people. But sometimes focusing too much on suffering, it's like it becomes painful after a while, you know. Some, pe some people lose their energy, they get depressed because they see much suf so much suffering in the world. Uh, and that can be the problem with compassion. Uh. And I know some people who practice Buddhism, they have fallen into that trap, too much focus on suffering and they lose their energy and they become depressed and sad people. That is exactly the opposite of what we should be doing. Yeah? The idea with these things is to lift our mind states up, to give us joy and happiness. Uh, so if it depresses you, then there is a problem. Huh? So metta is, e is easier with metta to give rise to those good qualities in mind. With karuna and compassion it is more tricky. Huh? It's sometimes easy to get it slightly wrong. Huh? And this is why you have this sequence. This is my theory anyway. I, the Buddha doesn't say that anywhere, but that's what I take to be the reason. And it is borne out by experience, uh, because many people have that experience of uh, go taking compassion a little bit too far. Uh. So, uh, you uh, 
act like a cow. Yeah, we have the cow again, one of the favorite animals in the similes, uh, or actually s sometimes anyway. And uh, so you get down like a cow, you suck up the water. Yeah, it's a tiny little puddle, tiny little bit of good qualities. Uh, you don't look too far to the left, don't look too far to the right. Focus with a kind of laser beam on the good qualities. Uh, and then you see the good qualities and then you uh, kind of build up this positive uh, perception on that basis. Uh, so uh, that is the uh, uh, one about focusing on the good qualities. But the problem is that sometimes we cannot see any good qualities. Sometimes we see people that it's really difficult to see good qualities in them. Uh, so what do we do in that case? If someone really is a scallywag, they really are a dodgy character, they do bad things by body speech, they think bad thoughts by mind, uh, what can we do then? And that is where compassion comes in, uh, because we cannot see any good things in that person. And this is the next one. And uh, one of the things to remember about this, again, is that when we cannot see any good qualities in somebody, there's all bad qualities there, remember this is just your perception of that person. Uh, yeah, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are like that. There may be other people who can see good qualities in them. Uh, the person is changing anyway. It's just your perception. Uh. And once you realize that it's just your perception, it's not actually the reality out there, uh, it means again that you are more flexible. You don't tie them down. You don't uh, make this a permanent judgment of the other person, whereby they are unable to change in your mind. Uh, you allow them to change. Down the track, maybe you start to see good qualities. Uh, it's only now that you have this problem with your perception. And this is true for all of these exercises. It's all about perception, and it's about our personal perception. It's about our personal world, not about whatever larger world may exist outside of you or in other people's minds. Uh, this is an important part of karuna, just to uh, allow change to occur. So this is how it is done. This is the, the number four here. And friends, how friends should resentment be removed towards a person whose bodily and verbal behavior are impure and who does not gain an opening of the mind, placidity of mind from time to time. Suppose a sick, afflicted, gravely ill person was traveling along a highway uh, and the last village behind him and the next village ahead of him were both far away. He would not or they would not obtain suitable food and medicine or a qualified attendant. They would not get to meet the leader of the village district. Uh, another person traveling along the highway might see them and arouse sheer compassion, sympathy and tender concern for them, thinking, oh, may this person obtain suitable food, suitable medicine and a qualified attendant. May they get to meet the leader of the village district. For what reason? So that this person does not encounter calamity and disaster right here. So too, when a person's bodily and verbal behavior are impure uh, and they do not gain from time to time an opening of the mind, a placidity of mind, uh, on that occasion one should arouse sheer compassion, sympathy and tender concern for them, thinking, oh, may this venerable one abandon bodily misbehavior and develop good bodily behavior. May they abandon uh, verbal misbehavior and develop good verbal behavior. May they abandon mental misbehavior and develop good mental behavior. For what reason? So that with the breakup of the body after death, uh, they will not be reborn in the plane of misery, uh, in a bad destination, in the lower world, in hell. In this way, resentment towards that person should be removed. And this is such a beautiful little simile. Uh, yeah, the idea that someone who is has bad behavior all the way through is like a sick person. Uh, they're like uh, ill. They are lying in the bed uh, they, if, through no fault of their own. Uh, and, uh, they, uh, uh, and this is what a person who is bad is like. So whenever you see someone who is bad, uh, who is treating you in the wrong way, uh, think of them as a sick person. Uh, yeah, it kind of takes away so much of the edge, uh, so much of the problem with uh, having to deal with people who are very difficult. Uh, it's a very skillful technique. And not only is it skillful, it actually is much more true than we tend to think. Remember that someone who is bad, who has bad qualities, uh, the first person they are hurting is always themselves. Uh, yeah? If you have bad qualities, you may have to bear the brunt or bear some of the problem of how they are acting. Uh, because you happen to be there, you have to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, 
but they have to bear far more of the consequences of the bad actions than you do. Uh. Here is a person who wants happiness. Everybody wants happiness. Uh. Yeah, I assume so. Uh. Yeah, is that right? Does everyone? I think everyone what wants to be happy, or depending a bit on how you define happiness. But you know, you want to be content, at peace, happy, joyful, uh, have met uh, compassion, all these qu good qualities. Uh, everybody wants that. Uh. And here is someone uh, who thinks that they are doing something good for themselves. We all think that we're doing what is good for ourselves and the world. Uh. We all think that. Uh. So here is someone who thinks that they're doing the right thing. Uh. They think they're doing what will lead to happiness for themselves. Uh, and actually, they are doing what will lead to suffering. Uh. They are dar in darkness. I've talked about this a few times already, but th this is what it, they are in the darkness. They are deluded. They have no idea what's going on. Uh. The lights are off and they keep on bumping the head all the time. Uh. And they don't realize, they think that they are happy when actually they are suffering. Uh. So when you see people like that, uh, it is very good grounds for having compassion because they don't know what they're doing. Uh. Yeah, they are, they are stupid. Uh. And unless they change, uh, they will continue creating suffering for themselves uh, and for the world around them for a long time into the future. Uh. And there's something very beautiful about this, because the reason why we tend to get upset by other people's bad qualities is because we take it personally. Uh. Yeah, they are being saying nasty things towards me. Uh. Yeah, it's me, it's about me. Yeah, how can they treat me like this? Uh, it is kind of self, it becomes very self-centered in a sense, or I shouldn't say self-centered because it's a very negative word, but it, it, it becomes about us. And it's natural enough. Uh, there's nothing really wrong with that, uh, because it is natural that we should feel this way. Uh, but still, it's not a pleasant state to be in. Uh, and the problem is this feeling that they are doing bad things towards me. We take it personally. But remember, it's not personal. Uh, Remember, the other person is acting the way they do, not because of you. You just happen to be there. You happen to be the person with certain character traits that they are reacting to. The reason they are the way they are is because of them, because of their own inner qualities, uh, because of their own inability to be kind, because of their own sickness, because of their own delusion. Uh, that is why they are the way they are. Uh, all the cause and conditions are coming together at that point, and then they act in a certain way. Uh, and what is beautiful about this uh, is that it takes away that sense of personal conflict. Uh, it is not about one person against another one. It's about natural phenomena occurring. Uh, these are the natural phenomena of people being conditioned in a certain way. And because they are conditioned in a certain way, they act badly. Uh, yeah, this is what this is about. Uh, and then it kind of changes the whole scenario. Uh, and once, instead of focusing on yourself, uh, instead of making it something that is about you and kind of being a slightly, you are self-centered. We're all self-centered to some extent, that's kind of natural. But instead of being self-centered in this case, uh, you like to turn the tables around uh, and you focus on the other person instead. Uh, and you start to feel, well, you are the one who has, you have a sickness, uh, yeah? Something isn't right. Uh, you don't understand what is going on. Uh, you want to be happy, but actually you're creating suffering for yourself and others. Uh, and in this way, you are, instead of having this narrow, self-centered feeling, uh, when we are self-centered, it's like we're going into us. It's a very small feeling. We go into our own little world. Uh, it's not an expansive thing like metta or compassion, where we kind of, uh, our heart opens up to the world around us. It's an expansive kind of mental, s mental state, whereby you, don't, you take in the whole world. Uh, yeah, you know the feeling when you get greedy or you get self-concerned too much. It's in the, you, you're in your own little, small little world uh, and you are scared of the world outside because when you're inside your own little world, you're creating a barrier between yourself and the world outside. And when you create the barrier between yourself and the world outside, that's where we become frightened. Uh, yeah, because it looks like the world is against us. Uh, this is my world. Stay away. These are my things. Don't touch my things. Yeah, this is, this is me. Go away, and you become frightened and a scared person because of that. Uh, but take that away, take that barrier away, and that's what you're doing by not being self-centered in this way, uh, by looking at compassion with the world around you. You expand your mind out, uh, and you take in all other people. You have a kindness for them, you have metta, you have compassion, and you have this beautiful, expansive mind. Uh, and even if other people are bad or whatever, they do the wrong thing, uh, still you have this expansive mind to the people world around you. And it's so much nicer. Uh, you don't have the fear anymore. Uh, okay, you want my things, take them. Yeah, this is yours. Uh, it's fine. doesn't matter. You can have it. Uh, yeah, and uh, what a wonderful kind of uh, state of mind that is, instead of being scared and inside our own little world. Uh. So this is kind of the idea here, as with so many other things, uh, 
on this Buddhist path, on the path of spirituality here. If you think about spirituality in the right way, it's good for you, it's also good for other people. It has this double, beautiful double effect. Compassion is good for you because it has a so much nicer mind state. And of course, compassion also is good for the other people as well. So l let us have a look at the, um, the simile here. So you have a sick, afflicted, gravely ill person traveling along a highway here. Yeah. This is like peop a person who is really doing bad things, yeah, they're traveling along the highway, they're going around in the world, whatever. Yeah. Uh, but they are alone, the last village behind them and the next village ahead of them is far away. There's no one to ask to for, for help from her. Uh, yeah. He does not obtain suitable food or medicine or a qualified attendant. Uh, who is the qualified attendant? Uh, like a kalyanamitta, yeah, it's like a, a suitable food, it's like the Dhamma. You read the Dhamma, it's suitable food for the heart. Uh, because they don't get access to the Dhamma, or because they are far away from the Dhamma, far between the villages, they don't have an interest, they don't understand what is in the best interest. Uh, they are far away from all of these things. Uh, uh, and you don't get to meet the leader of the village district. Who is that? Maybe the Buddha. Maybe the Buddha is the leader of the village district. Uh, and then another man comes traveling along the highway, yeah, another person. Uh, and you see this person who is sick, who is ill, uh, and because you see that they uh, are suffering so much, uh, you have compassion and sympathy for them. Uh, when someone is sick, it's not their fault usually. Uh, sick, sickness just comes to this human body occasionally, there's nothing really c you can much you can do about that. Uh, and because these things happen, you have compassion for someone who is sick. Uh, in the same way, you have compassion for someone who is full of bad qualities, because it is a very much more similar situation than sometimes we are willing to uh, accept, perhaps. Uh, and then uh, you wish them well, you wish them, you want them to obtain uh, all of these things, so they can be freed from their suffering. Uh, yeah? Otherwise they will meet with calamity and disaster. This is a Bhikkhu Bodhis translation. Calamity, yeah, that's, that's like really powerful word, uh, <laughs> meeting with calamity and disaster uh, right there. Uh, um, and uh, so, uh, so, that, 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 so there you are, that is, the, uh, that is the simile, and that calamity and disaster of course is only small if you just die, and it's far greater if you uh, act with body, speech and mind in a bad way, uh, then the effects are far, far worse for a long time into the future. Uh. So uh, that is how to think about other people, uh, to remember that other people tend to be run by causes and conditions. Uh, you know, I always like the simile of the traffic light. Uh, the traffic light, when the traffic light goes red, uh, do you get out of your car and shout at the traffic light? Uh, do, you see, do people do that here in KL? Uh, kind of, no? What, you traffic light, you knew that I was in a hurry. Yeah, I, I was in a hurry and then you get red just when I came around the corner. You terrible traffic light, evil traffic light. Uh, and then you go out and you give the traffic light a good shake because you're really angry with the traffic light. Uh, and all the other people, they think you are completely nuts when they see you doing this. They think you better p send you off to a mental asylum because... Uh, <laughs> and, but the thing is that, and this is kind of the thing, that people are in a large, to a large part, they are like traffic lights. Yeah, People act according to the cause and conditions around them and inside of them and from the past lives. Uh, they do things without really having much control over it. Uh, and once you kind of get that idea that people are more like robots than really li than individual things, uh, uh, the more you get that, uh, the more easy it is to forgive, the more easy it is to have compassion for them, because you understand they are trapped in the delusion, they are trapped in the bad qualities, they can't get out. When you teach them the Dhamma, they say, no, I don't want to hear about the Dhamma. You know that feeling? Yeah, you say, okay, I've got these wonderful teachings for you, why don't you, do you want to hear them? No, no, not interested at all, yeah? What can you do? You can't do anything, yeah? Even if you have compassion for them, there's nothing, you are at a loss uh, because they are so blocked by their bad qualities, by the delusion, it's impossible to change them around. So you just have to shrug your shoulders and say, okay, whatever, you have to do your thing and I will do my thing, yeah, and that's okay. Yeah. So this is a very uh, wonderful way and the reason why it is so hard to see people like traffic lights, the reason why it is so hard to see them like robots, uh, is because it feels like we have so much independence. It feels like we make choices all the time. Yeah, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna eat this particular thing, I'm gonna drink 
apple juice or, or water. Ah, I can choose, so much choice, yeah, it's really nice. So, but how much choice do I really have? Yeah, I'm probably, whatever I choose to do, probably has been conditioned by something in the past when I eventually make the choice. Or maybe even if I make the choice not to have anything right now. Uh, and the more, so it is this illusion of control inside of ourselves uh, that actually stops us often from appreciating how much we are like robots, how much we are like traffic lights. Uh, so you have to kind of, one of the ways of doing this is to reduce that illusion a little bit uh, and look at yourself and see how conditioned you are. Uh, yeah, and how you we tend to follow habits, patterns, uh, how this, what seems to be a choice here, well this probably isn't a choice either. When eventually I make a choice, it will be according to cause and conditions that it happens. Uh, and then the more you get that, uh, the more easy it is to forgive, uh, the more easy it is to, uh, to have compassion for people. Uh. Yeah, and it's very beautiful because there comes a point, you can forgive everyone. Uh. The most greatest mass murderer in history, uh, you can forgive them because you realize they too uh, were trapped by the conditions. Uh. So you have compassion for the victims. Uh. You have compassion for the perpetrator here. You have compassion for everyone here. And then uh, we uh, get a far better world when that happens. Uh, and your spiritual life gets a massive boost uh, because you no longer are trapped in your own, your own reactions to other people. Why do you react with anger and upset when people do things? Often it's just a ha ha habitual reaction. Yeah? You watch TV, you see something bad, you get a bit upset. Uh, why? Well, often you can't stop yourself. Uh. So this is the way to stop yourself contemplate this thing, uh, think about it in this way, and gradually these things will decline. Uh. Okay, let's move on to the last person. Uh. And how, friends, uh, should resentment be removed towards the person whose bodily and verbal behavior are pure, and who from time to time gains an opening of the mind, placidity of mind? So this is the person who has only good qualities. Uh. Suppose there were a pond with clear, sweet, cool water, clean with smooth banks, a delightful place shaded by various trees. Then a man might arrive afflicted and oppressed by the heat, weary, thirsty and parched. Having plunged into the pond, he would bathe and drink, and then, coming, uh, and then after coming out, he would sit and lie down in the shade of a tree right there. So too, when a person's bodily and verbal behavior are pure, and from time to time he gains an opening of the mind, placidity of mind, on that occasion one should attend to his pure bodily behavior, to his pure verbal behavior, and to the opening of the mind, the placidity of mind that he gains from time to time. In this way, resentment towards that person should be removed. Friends, by means of a person who inspires confidence in every way, the mind gains confidence. So here you have the pond with beautiful water. Yeah, there's no algae, you will notice here, no water plants, there's no defilements. Uh, yeah? uh, so this is the person with all good qualities all the way around. Uh, and, not, and even the environment around this person is nice. The banks are nice, the delightful place shaded by various trees. Uh, sounds like some kind of tropical paradise with you know, the coconut palms leaning over the beach and you're just kind of chilling on the beach under in the shade of the coconut palm or something like that. Uh, in my part of the world where I come from, this is kind of the paradise, yeah, because uh, where I come from is so cold. Uh, whoa, so this kind of is the, the really par paradise thing here. And then you get this man who arrives, uh, who is again hot, you're angry, uh, uh, and you are thirsty, and so you're looking for a solution to your anger. Uh, and uh, this is always interesting, is that, uh, you know, even when people are saintly, uh, people get angry with them. Uh, yeah, people got angry with the Buddha. Wouldn't recommend getting angry with the Buddha, not such a good idea, but that's what happens in the suttas. Uh, people get angry with the Buddha, especially there were uh, cases where the uh, people would become Buddhist, become Buddhist monks. Uh, and the uh, people were not happy with that, yeah, because they might be Brahmins, they might be very proud of their Brahmanical tradition. We are Brahmins, we are the top of society, we are the top caste, everyone else is below us. And then these scallywag samanas, yeah, the, the Buddhist, whatever, they come and they take, give Thelo Dhamma and then they convert our brothers yeah, and sisters or whatever and they become monastics. And then they become really angry with the Buddha and they go and scold the Buddha and they shout at him. Uh, and the Buddha just kind of sits there and listens to them and, and uh, uh, <laughs> doesn't take it on board, of course. 
So uh, this is the problem with life sometimes. Sometimes we get it wrong uh, and we get angry with people who are actually very pure. Uh, and uh, this happens and it's okay. You don't have to feel too concerned about it. Uh, uh, sometimes people think that you know, getting angry with people who are very developed is bad, but sometimes it's impossible to avoid these things altogether. Uh, uh, so just, uh, you just look at it and then you see and then you, when you realize your mistake, then you kind of correct your mistake afterwards. Uh, it's not such a, such a big problem. What is more important is that we are circumspect, you are careful uh, and you judge carefully with intelligence uh, what the qualities of another person are and as long as you judge these things carefully and with intelligence uh, then that is really what matters the most. Uh, so if you don't look carefully and you just denounce somebody uh, yeah, regardless of having judged carefully or not uh, then, without th then that is where really bad karma happens yeah and you say bad things about people without really reflecting properly then it is really uh, really bad uh. but uh, occasionally getting angry with uh, anyone really is actually it's okay here yeah. so you you do this and then you come and of course this time there's no algae and water plants yeah nothing to push away or push aside you just plunge into the pond yeah and you bathe and drink you take on board all those good qualities uh. and then after coming out you don't walk off uh, but you actually sit down right there in the shade of the tree uh, and it's almost as if the presence of that other person is delightful. Uh. Sometimes you are in the presence with people where you feel really at ease, really relaxed, you really enjoy yourself, uh, someone who might, and they might have some very good qualities uh, or whatever, and then you, perhaps you become even a disciple of that person, yeah? Or at the very least you hang out with them, they become a Kalyanamitta. Why? Because you realize this person is supportive for my practice. Uh. So this is a kind of a beautiful way. You deal with your anger and then you hang out with them afterwards and they become your, your, your friends, your, ma your mates in the whole life, as we might say in Australia. Uh, and um, so this is uh, uh, this idea of people who are uh, special. Uh, and I should maybe mention here while we're at it, because one of the things that you sometimes hear in Buddhist culture, uh, and which I think can be is dangerous and not really a right way of looking at things. Uh, and this is the thing when people say, oh, you mustn't criticize this particular person because they're an arahant. Yeah? Because an arahant, if you criticize them, you will make bad karma. Yeah? So, and then uh, if we think too much like that, uh, after a while we become really stupid. Because everyone thinks somebody, it's always someone who thinks somebody is an arahant. Uh, it means after a while you can't criticize anyone. You, or you can't, it's not so much about criticizing, uh, but you can't see when there's a bad quality there, uh, you can't kind of share it with others. Uh, and then we end up becoming very stupid as Buddhists. Uh, because sometimes there are bad things happening also in the Buddhist world. Uh, sometimes there are people who are not really worthy of that kind of uh, uh, confidence and faith that uh, uh, sometimes people give them. Uh, so we have to have open eyes, uh, we have to see what is there and when they are good qualities uh, it is okay to share it with other people. Uh, if people get abused or people get used in a bad way, uh, if we don't share it with others uh, then what we're doing, we're just perpetuating that abuse happening to other people afterwards. Uh, yeah. If someone really does something dodgy, something which really is against the Vinaya in a serious way, or the break some of the very important rules of the Vinaya, it has to be shared. Otherwise, uh, we are deluding ourselves. We think that someone is a special person, when in fact, clearly, they are not. Uh, so it is okay. The Buddha actually says, he says in the, this is one of the suttas, that if someone is worthy of dispraise, uh, it is good karma to dispraise them. Uh. And if someone is worthy of praise, it is good karma to praise them. Uh, yeah? uh, the problem is, if we don't think properly, if we are kind of quick in our judgment, uh, and we judge people quickly, and then we start praising and dispraising kind of slightly randomly, that is bad. Uh, but if we judge with care, and we look carefully, uh, and then we, uh, say, we talk about what we see, and we may not make absolute judgment, uh, but we see you know, possible problems, uh, then actually it is an important thing, and it's an important part of how we deal with things in the Buddhist world. Uh, if we get into this idea too much that, oh no, they're all arahants, can't say anything, uh, and you know, it's bad karma, actually it is not bad karma. If someone does something bad and we don't say anything, that is sometimes worse. Uh, so we have to be honest about what is happening in the world, uh, otherwise we become stupid Buddhists. Uh, and that is not really worthwhile. Uh. So, uh, this is then the last person, yeah, the person where it is easy to uh, get rid of resentment because they have all good qualities. Uh, 
And then uh, at the very end here he says, friends by means of a person who inspires confidence in every way. This is the Samanta Pasadika person. This is the place in the suttas where the, this is the, actually the word, the name for the commentary to the Vinaya, and that is actually occurs in the suttas right there. Uh, by means of such a person, the mind gains confidence. Uh, yeah, sometimes when you see someone in this world, someone with uh, lots of good qualities and who is a special person, very peaceful, has all the right qualities, uh, you gain confidence in the Dhamma because you start to see something which is not usually visible in the world. Uh, usually we don't see people who are special, who have qualities, who are always kind, always never really get angry, uh, who are always have a degree of peace, always have a bit of time. Uh, this is so unusual. So when you see someone like that, it's like, wow, what is going on here? Uh, nobody is like that. Uh, so that's why the Buddha says just seeing someone who is an arahant in this world is a great benefit uh, because you see a potential, you see a possibility here. Uh, and that seeing that possibility raises your spirits uh, because it reminds you, I too can go there. Uh, if it is available to other people, it is available to me. Uh, and it lifts up the possibility of the spiritual life in this world. Uh, it gives, gives you an insight into what actually can be done with the human mind, the potential with the human mind. So just seeing an arahant is a wonderful thing. Yeah. And this is kind of the nice thing in Buddhism, yeah, is that uh, uh, in Christianity or whatever you have to kind of believe in God, but it's dif more difficult to access God. In Buddhism at least we have some degree of access uh, by there is a path uh, and it's supposed to give results uh, and uh, ideally we can see those results in people around us, uh, uh, sometimes at least, uh, and what a, what a wonderful thing that is. Uh, and this is what this uh, in part is about. Uh. So, uh, uh, there you are, uh, but um, yeah, I think uh, that's probably enough. So then he says, just to finish off, these friends are the five ways of removing resentment, uh, by which means of which a bhikkhu, bhikkhuni, uh, upasaka, upasaka, can entirely remove resentment towards whomever it has arisen. Uh, so, there you are. So next time I come back to KL, Am I coming back to KL? If I come back to KL again, we'll see what happens. Then we will give you a test and see if you have passed this test of removing resentment towards others. Uh, so we'll get some, someone to come off the street, some, some really kind of character, who, a good actor, who can be really nasty, and then we'll see how people react to this, this actor. Uh, give them a good test. Uh, sometimes we need kind of to test people out a little bit. Uh. Anyway, that is uh, all for now. So uh, uh, let's have a break, 15, 20 minutes or so, and come back again, and then we will uh, do some meditation together afterwards. Sir.